Life Unrehearsed, brought to you by Leanna's Senior Transition Support, helping you navigate home care and senior residences. And good afternoon. Welcome to Life Unrehearsed. I'm Matt Dalvecchio, specializing in home care, downsizing in the senior living industry. Thank you for tuning in. Coming up on the first half of the show, did you ever wonder how brain surgeons get trained? Well, let's face it, it's not exactly a surgery you want done by a rookie surgeon. Well, you're in for a treat because I'm going to be talking about the fascinating career of Dr. Rolando Del Maestro, who's delved into everything from neurosurgery and simulation, artificial intelligence, Leonardo da Vinci's art, and co-founded the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. He is in studio with me today and on the second half of the show, addressing the medical needs of older adults, the misconceptions around their care and strategies for caregivers. And we're going to wrap up the show talking about the Ethel and Morty Fruchter Summit Cafe. This is a wonderful initiative that helps students with special needs integrate into the workforce. All right, you know, I quickly want to talk about an upcoming webinar that I'm going to be participating in from Seniors Action Quebec, where I'm going to be a panelist. Uh, Seniors Action Quebec, as you may know, is just an amazing advocacy group, um, always uh, bringing wonderful topics and interesting um, subjects for our older adults. And the topic we're going to be talking about is what's next in housing. And they've organized a great lineup of panelists, including James Hughes. Hughes. He's the uh, president and CEO of the Old Brewery Mission. Richard Goldman from Educalois. Kate Coulter is going to be there. She's the president of Villa Beau Repair and director of gerontology. And Jacques Baudouin is a housing advocate. And I'm going to be talking about the latest in public and private residences and some recent government support programs that are out there for our older adults. That is going to be on Friday at 1.30. You simply have to look up Seniors Action Quebec. They've got a great website, lots of resources there. Just go on events and you'll see it there. You can register and it is free of charge. All right. Um, Now, Let's talk about the brain. By far, it's our most fascinating organ. It's so complex. Well, our next guest says that there's still a lot of research still to get done on this topic. Dr. Rolando Del Maestro contributed to the foundation of the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. He's also the director of the Neurosurgical Simulation and Artificial Intelligence Learning Center at McGill University. And he's largely involved with the Osler Library of the History of Medicine at McGill, which, by the way, is one of the five most important history of of medicine libraries in the world and joining us today to talk about maintaining healthy brains and his incredible career, Dr. Rolando Del Maestro in studio with me. Dr. Del Maestro, welcome to Life Unrehearsed. Thank you very much, Matt. Well, thank you for coming in here. Uh, really, you know, the brain is fascinating. You have seen it all in your career and a storied career it is. So first of all, tell us about your journey in medicine and, and how you started. Well, I think... <laughs> I was born in a small sort of village in the northern part of Italy, uh, just after the Second World War. And uh, clearly it was a time period of a lot of difficulty, and my parents decided to come to Canada, as many from that particular village did. And because there wasn't enough money around, my my father initially um, uh, borrowed the money, came to Canada first, and about nine months later I arrived with my mother. Uh, And we came through Pier 21, like many other people have have done. Mm And uh, uh, I started my life in Ontario, a small town in Ontario, uh, went on to a Western University, uh, decided uh, through that time period that I thought that the brain was the most complex organ in the universe and the most complex thing in the universe, and that was sort of the excitement for me. Um, It was difficult to to decide whether to go into neurology or neurosurgery, but I found that using my hands was an important aspect of what I wanted to do, and therefore neurosurgery was that part of my my choice. I finished my neurosurgical training in London, did a PhD in Sweden, which was a very important time in my life, and then uh, practiced in London for about 20 years, and in 2000 came to Montreal to uh, direct the um, Brain Tumor uh, Research Center at McGill University. And uh, so uh, most of my life has really been involved in uh, work specifically related to brain tumors. I've operated on thousands of brain tumors in my life. And uh, my basic sort of role now is to try to improve, uh, let's say, brain tumor operations throughout the world. And that's why I got involved in virtual reality and artificial intelligence. We're going to talk a, a little more about this virtual reality, but I want to address the brain tumor, a big part of your life. And um, I'd like to know what was the inspiration behind the creation of the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada that you're one of the co-founders and for what I understand with your wife, Pam, as well. 
<laughs> right. Well, <clears throat> coming back from um, from my uh, PhD in uh, in Sweden um, and starting neurosurgery, it was very clear that there was not very much available for the brain tumor patients at that time, and not a lot of literature. There wasn't a lot of research going on. And then uh, one of my uh, dear friend's daughter, uh, Steve Northy, uh, developed a brain tumor. She was eight, mm. and unfortunately, she, she passed away from uh, the brain tumor. And uh, after that episode, uh, really turning a bad thing into more of a good thing, uh, the three of us got around a table, and we decided to just start a brain tumor foundation, and we did. It's as simple as that. And now it's a cross, it's a cross Canada organization. It has uh, support groups in many, many cities, in, including Montreal, and it is uh, it serves patients. Most patients in Canada who have brain tumors interact with it, and it provides lots of research and uh, uh, funding for research. And I think it's uh, Pam and I, my wife and I, say many, many times it is probably the best thing that we've ever done. Along with Steve, of course, the co-founder. Yeah, and it's uh, it's amazing just to hear how it started and uh, what you've built it up to. So important, and uh, you continue along uh, uh, with that. And, you know, we think of brain tumors. Sometimes we automatically go towards the elderly or, or more an older population. But, in fact, uh, like you experienced firsthand with Steve and his daughter, uh, there's a lot of brain tumors in all ages, correct? Well, what, what I think a lot of people don't know is that brain tumors... Uh, takes a life of more children with cancer than any other any other cancer except for leukemia and since leukemia is now really on the way to being cured it's now the most the most common or soon will be the most common uh, sort of tumor that uh, results in the death of children so that's why it's an important area and I spent much of a life my life look at working in the in the lab and working clinically to try to improve that mm. listening to life on rehearse Matt Del Vecchio here and I'm talking with Dr. Rolando Del Maestro director of the neurosurgical simulation and artificial intention uh, intelligence learning center at McGill and as you just heard co-founder of the brain tumor foundation of Canada now Dr. Del Maestro you know brains more than most, and let's get a, a, a good uh, public service announcement out to our listeners in terms of what are the signs of a healthy brain and, and what can we do to maintain a healthy brain? I think the most important part of anybody's life is to be engaged. And engagement with life is what, what the brain is all about. You know, while, while you're young, let's say before the age of five, you're putting on lots of new cells to about 25, 30, you're making connections with those cells. And the more you're engaged with life, the more you're involved with what's going on around you, nature, uh, the culture, the your family, the more your brain can grow, develop new connections, and actually be better for you. Obviously, as you grow older, you lose some of those activities. And again, the more you're engaged with life, as far as I'm concerned, the better you are. So if I had one thing to say, be engaged with life. You know, write write your poems, write your stories. You know, have a great time with your family. Uh, if you do that, I think you'll leave. If you don't live a long, um, beautiful life, you'll certainly have a great, great life that you have. Great words of advice. I'm involved with a lot of seniors in, in my world and, and deal with a lot of cognitive challenges and Alzheimer's and, and stimulation of the brain. It just keeps going um, back to that and that engagement like you're talking about. So I think wonderful words of advice. It's up to you. Engagement could be a whole bunch of things and uh, just do what you need to do to keep that brain engaged. Now, I want to um, switch it up a little bit because I am so fascinated with this neurosurgery simulation and artificial intelligence learning center at mcgill very involved with that and fascinating i'm sure in your decades of a career when we talk about ai didn't even exist right you're doing virtual reality can you tell us a little bit about simulation and how important that means for all of us well one of the important things you know when you're training surgeons is um how do you train surgeons and most of it has always been what is called an apprenticeship model so you basically start uh, your surgical career as an apprentice. And over a period of neurosurgery, it's about six years, eight years. And usually you've, you're into it for by about 12 years mm -hmm. before you go out and practice. So that's been the, the area. That's how it's occurred really almost from the beginning of time. So one of the things that has been a concern to us is that when you are thinking about, for example, developing a new operation or something like that, should we you know, do that uh, in, a, in this apprenticeship type of model? Or should we use virtual reality to train people initially on a virtual reality type of situation so they can have a faster sort of a learning uh, trajectory with the hope that we can get people to a higher level quicker 
and to stay at that higher level for as long as possible mm-hmm. and to be really to be as good as they possibly can forever and ever. Uh, so that that's basically what it's about. And we're going to expand a little bit uh, on that. It's uh, fascinating some of the things you were describing off air about just getting students uh, and future surgeons the real experience. And we're going from virtual reality, incorporating AI into it. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And in true life unrehearsed fashion, you are one of the largest private collectors of materials related to Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, wait until you hear what Dr. Del Maestro has done and what he has collected over the years. And welcome back to Life Unrehearsed. Matt Del Vecchio here. A little amore and a little Italy for you as I'm with Dr. Rolando Del Maestro, Director of the Neurosurgical Simulation and Artificial Intelligence Learning Center and the co-founder of the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. What a wealth of knowledge. Really dedicated his life to improve our lives. Um... Dr. Del Maestro, just I want to just continue along. You were talking about uh, simulation for neurosurgery, and it was virtual reality, and now we're moving in sort of into this next phase of AI, artificial intelligence. And what's your perspective on that, and, and how is that improving from a research perspective? Well, if I look at the future, I think that if you look at five to ten years from now, I think every surgeon who is training, is going to be trained on virtual reality systems, virtual reality operations, and and having an AI sort of tutor, AI systems to help us understand how his hands are moving, what, what, how, how to do that operation better. And we've actually developed a tutor, for example, that talks with you, actually teaches you how to do an operation. And so that's part of the plan that's going forward. The other part is that I think the operating room in the next five or 10 years, it's going to be completely revolutionized by artificial intelligence. Mm. There's going to be an artificial intelligence system in almost every operating room in the world. And what that system will do is it'll continually monitor what's going on. It'll monitor with all the information you can get from artificial intelligence. And with that information can sort of guide the surgeon and help the surgeon do a better operation. So the combination of artificial intelligence and the surgeon's ability will really get the best possible outcomes for each individual patient. And particularly, I think particularly what will happen is it will decrease error will decrease errors that occur in the operating room because the system will be able to actually predict that an error might occur and therefore can actually warn the surgeon that it, that you're coming towards, you're using too much force, you're using too much, you know, different types of activity during the operation, modify that so you don't cause an error. So those that's what's happening. That There's nothing going to stop that. That's just, just going to go on. Very, very exciting, particularly when we're dealing with the brain. You know, it's not like a hip or a knee replacement here. We're talking crucial, crucial um you know, surgeons and uh, wanting uh, zero error for, uh, you know, room exactly. for air, you know, and, and zero, uh, um, zero room for air. And, and you've, you, that's what is so exciting about this, you know, and uh, um, we, I want to switch gears a little bit because as mentioned in true life unrehearsed uh, fashion, Leonardo da Vinci, um, as it turns out, you are one of the largest private collectors of materials from Leonardo da Vinci. Let's hear about that. How did this get started? Where did this passion come from? And uh, tell us about it. Well, when I was a um, in medical school, I was quite in, interested in creativity throughout all my undergraduate work. And one of my teachers, whose name was Jaroslav um, uh, Havelka, uh, who was at Western at that time, uh, he believed that Ed Mozart was the most creative person that had ever lived. And uh, to pass his particular course, which I happened to be into, was you had to pick someone else. And so one of the questions you have is, who do you, who do you pick? And it's hard to pick another, another sort of musician because he'd already told you that Mozart was the most creative and Mozart music was playing all the time in, the, in our class. So you had to go somewhere else. And I came across a, a small book, uh, um, a small paperback, basically. Uh, and in that particular ba- paperback, it, it basically commented about the fact that Leonardo da Vinci, in his, his attempt to understand the world, was really in one way more a magician, more someone who was trying to find some type of secret that only a few people have access to. And that sort of interested me. And so I basically brought him as my my champion against Mozart because we had to have one-on-one conversations with the professor. He only believed in pass-fail. There was nothing else as far as he was concerned. So in those particular discussions, I did okay, but I think 
he really felt that take, you know, picking someone like Leonardo, I could have done much, much, much better. And clearly, the problem was I was an intern at the time. Mm-hmm. Even going to his class was difficult. And I think part of this whole business has been the idea that I always want to get a better mark. This is an okay. attempt to get a better mark mm-hmm. from from a really important mentor in my life, an extremely important mentor who really, I think, taught me much about, you know, how, how the brain actually works to make the world better. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was it was, it was was a joy to be in his class, absolute joy. And that led to this passion. And if I were to say, you know, what would be one of your treasured uh, possessions in this collection? I have a number of I have a number of uh, drawings by uh, Francesco Melzi, who was Leonardo's favorite student, mm. and Francesco tended to um, r- reproduce Le- Leonardo's drawings that had been that had been used so much that they're no longer available. So I have some of those, and and one of them, for example, a few of them have been actually um, uh, let's say been in uh, gallery exhibitions in Rome, for example. So that's some of my more and more interesting stuff. But I have. I have a very extensive collection, so it's hard to choose. <laughs> and you've created a wonderful book that you brought into studio and, and so many pictures and, and of the collection. Fascinating and uh, good for you. We're going to bring it back to, um, uh, you know, your medical uh, students are so important uh, for you and your wife. And, and, I, and I say your wife, your wife is also one of the co-founders of the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. So in what ways do you and your wife support uh, your current medical students? Well, we, um, Pam and I have endowed two, uh, two uh, systems. One is uh, an essay contest for medical students at McGill. And this essay contest allows them to sort of explore the humanities, explore something a little different than, than, um, than medicine. And I think it's been one of the very important things, for example, that, they, uh, that the Osir Library of the History of Medicine have been involved with. And we've also done the same for the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. It, it provides prizes for sort of undergraduate students who come up with the best ideas of how to how to uh, sort of solve the brain tumor problem. So those are two things that we've been involved with from that point of view. That's just fascinating. We're already uh, out of time. We can go on and on. I want to thank you very much, Dr. DeMaestro, for coming in. You know, how can our listeners find out a little bit more about the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada? Well, the best thing to do is to go to the website, which is braintumor.ca, and uh, it's tumor, T-O- M O U R rather than O R. Yeah, T U M O U R, the Canadian one, right? Not so braintumor.ca. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. You are a true family man. Your wife's in studio with me and your grandsons, Tatum and Liam. Thanks, guys, for listening in to Nono. And uh, really, thank you on behalf of all Montrealers for everything you've done. Thank you very much. That's Dr. Rolando Del Maestro, Director of the Neurosurgical Simulation and Artificial Intelligence Learning Center and co founder of the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada.